something is not working. I don't know what it is. Yeah, we need some help here because it's not working. Uh, how are you, man? <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah, could you? Because it's not working. We're getting nowhere again. What the hell? Uh, well, I put I put that one back on, but it's not. But th that one's not working. Let's also get rid of that. Can you see the screen? Huh? Sorry. Ah. Okay, I can't get rid of photos. Oh, let's see. Cancel. Just bury that. Screen. Yeah, full screen. There you go. Oh, they're over here. Right there. It was on just a minute ago and it just died. If it's easier, we can just copy the program and put it on the other Mac. Yeah. It's, uh, Yeah, I mean, I can ju it's just a keynote, which is a standard yeah. Mac program, and I can just yeah. put it on a yeah. flash drive. Yeah. Okay. Can I you want to do that? that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, flash drive? I don't have a flash drive, but uh, okay, if you get, get, get one, that'd be great. No worries, I was late myself, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, except uh, I don't have USB, unless I do this here. Here, here. Hmm? Okay. All right. There it is. Oh, it's not doing anything. Just do it manually. Like you turn that one. It's copying. Yeah, but it's so slow. Yeah, that'll help things. Copy. 
Sure. Okay. No problem. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. After one year of. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, most of you already attended a lot of uh, HIPAA lectures here, and we are back today with a very powerful lecture for Brian Peterson. And uh, yeah, you came. <laughs> I think we have uh, technical uh, issues now after one year, the system, you know, <laughs> we need to recover. Okay, meanwhile, uh, we uh, have some orientation, please. Uh, I'm allowed to take my mask because I am a little bit uh, far away from you. Uh, please don't take your mask off your face and keep the social distancing. Yeah. And uh, we will have 15 minutes of a um, uh, 15 minutes break after about one hour. Um, if you need anything, if you have any question, please let me know. If you have even any question or difficulties submitting your photos to our uh, competition, let me know. Everything uh, is okay? You submitted already your photos? Not yet? Don't wait till last minute. <laughs> Please don't wait to last minute because it will be Sorry, difficult for you okay. and for us. Sometimes the server will be so uh, loaded and so crowded that people cannot upload on time. I know people, they upload their photos at 11.58 uh, in the evening. <laughs> yeah, please don't wait that long. Uh, submit your photos a little bit airy, earlier that okay. you make it uh, easier for yourself. I think we will use the screens. Okay. Well, that works for and me, don't forget, uh, this uh, lecture, as usual, here. is um, uh, oh, live yeah, streamed yeah, on yeah, YouTube. Okay. <laughs> if you have some friends <laughs> or go. family that uh, yeah. couldn't make it today, you can send them uh, the link. It is our channel, HIPAA okay. channel on YouTube. Well, I wish you a very happy yeah, lecture. Continue. And see you next time also. Don't forget to take your uh, certificates, yeah? Okay, After finishing the lecture. Right? Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Right. okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's fine. Oh, the audio is fine. Yeah, thanks. Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, no mess. <laughs> uh, I've been tested for COVID 11 times, just so you know. Negative, which is a positive. So, yeah, um, I get tested again on Tuesday. That's what happens when you continue to travel the world and you say no, COVID is not going to keep me from traveling as long as countries are going to welcome me. So thank you, Dubai, for welcoming me uh, despite COVID. Um, my name is Brian Peterson, and um, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, tonight, my presentation is going to cover. A lot of ground, uh, but to kind of give me a sense of who I'm talking to, I would really like to know, just by a show of hands, is if there's anybody in here who's picked up a camera for the first time in the last 12 months. One? Two? Well, I mean, there's like before 12 months, you hadn't done photography. Oh, you hadn't done Yeah, that's what I mean. In other words, you're, you're new to photography in the last year. Anybody? No? You? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Anybody two years and under? Two-year-olds? OK, good. Yeah. Well, look, for what it's worth, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I still feel like a two-year-old. I honestly do. Every day I wake up, and it's like, wow, this is a great chance to maybe go out and try to make some, some new images and make discoveries. And the, ultimately, my goal, which I, I would hope would be your goal, you want at the end of the day, to come home with what I call spoils of adjectives, as opposed to nouns. And I can't stress that enough. I like to suggest to everybody, your target is to go out and capture adjectives. But unfortunately, most people, 
at least initially, end up shooting nouns. And there's a huge difference, big difference. Nouns are important, but adjectives, in effect, think of it this way. A noun is a wedding cake, and an adjective is the frosting. Okay? Uh, it doesn't really change the composition of the cake, the adjective, other than it calls attention to the incredible, amazingly beautiful, tantalizing, wonderful cake. And so my job is to hopefully get you to start to see the amount of adjectives that are really out there in this world. And I can't stress this enough, which is why I'm going to start the program on this note. The way to find your shortest route to adjectives, ironically, is through the elements of design. And a thorough understanding of the elements design starts with the recognition that everybody in this room, I'm looking at you, I'm looking at the elements of design that you are occupying, and that is you are all sitting in what is recognizable as a shape of a chair. That chair is comprised of lines, lines that close on themselves. So you have a chair with a rectangular seat and a rectangular back and curvilinear lines for armrests. That's an example of elements of design. The noun is the chair. Your job is to shoot it in a way that doesn't become easily recognizable as a chair, but instead chair parts, as I call it. So that's how we're going to begin. And I want to begin with the elements of design, mainly starting with line. Lines can be short. Lines can be long. Lines can be thick. They can be thin. We use the word line in our expressions daily, such as, that's the end of the line for me, which is another way of saying I'm done. Or you go to the movie theater expecting to see a short line. But it's long, and it affects you emotionally. Oh, my goodness, oh come on. It's going to be an hour before you can get in. And it's upsetting. Traffic is long, lots of lines of traffic. And that's upsetting. But to a photographer, the idea of lots of traffic Dusk, blue hour as it's called, you're shooting a city scene, it's a big S curve, and you oh, this is great! Look at that long line of red lights and I mean tail lights and headlights, and it's gonna look wonderful on the picture. So you embrace long lines for some reasons, and in other reasons, of course, you cast them aside and just ruins your day. So my point is we begin with line, and then from line we go to the next thing, which is texture, and from texture we go from shape and form, and from shape and form we go to pattern. At about that point, we'll probably take a break because I got a pretty extensive presentation on color. And then amongst all this, we're going to talk about news flash. You have a flash. Why don't you use it? As well as the Sunny 16, as well as a bonus tip on wide angle lenses. And believe it or not, I'm about to say something that's pretty profound if you know me. And that is that everybody here should be embracing with two giant hugs. Oh, I love Photoshop. Y'all on board with that? <laughs> for the right reasons, for the wrong reasons. I'm suggesting embracing Photoshop for the right reasons, but that'll be at the very end of the presentation. And here's what I want to say about that. Photoshop, in my estimation, has never ever been the tool to use for any other reason other than to expand your vision, not replace it. It's a huge difference, huge difference. I can't tell you how many people, students, I should clarify that by, by saying students, who I've been teaching for years at my school, who will try to sneak in a Photoshopped image. <laughs> was that sky really there? Yeah, yeah. You mean it was really there in somebody's library that you borrowed and put in? In other words, swapped out a sky. I got no problem with that, just be truthful. Take ownership of the fact that you didn't shoot the sky. It belongs to somebody else. Photoshop now comes preloaded with skies. Have you noticed that, the newest version? That's bad. It's unfortunate. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where you look at an idea and you think, you know, the only way this idea would work is if I photoshopped, meaning a layer mask. Um, and I, we'll have examples of that. In fact, I have one example that I hope you find quite amusing. Uh, and we'll get that towards the end. But in the meantime, let's begin. And uh, without further ado, a couple things. I'll get the announcements out of the way here. This is me, Brian Peterson. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, that's how you reach me. Pretty simple. And usually three days a week, my Instagram posts are predominantly 
photography tips. So for those of you that follow me, you probably already know that. And uh, that's my intention to keep doing that because it's a lot of fun. So I, I really find a great joy in sharing how to take great photos. Speaking of which, I am not one of these photographers who will stand before you and tell you, and I love doing this because it's really a magnification of a lot of people, you know, great photography cannot survive without great light. As if somehow, pretty good, huh? <laughs> um, that's so not true. And this is what I have to say to that. Great light rarely saves a poor composition, but a great composition will always salvage poor light. And if you don't believe me, then you're living in a dream world because you're living in a world where it literally sun comes up and it stays warm light for 24 hours doesn't happen. Your job is to make great photos and you don't always can do that in great light. Yes, you have a studio. Okay, fine. You can argue the point and say we can make all the light we want in the studio. You can also make light in Photoshop. But I'm also suggesting there are many, many examples, even in this presentation, where they do not rely on great light. Inclement weather. Do you think a snowstorm is great light? No. Not theoretically. It's not, there's no light at all per se. So with that in mind, let's begin. Line. Obviously, this is an image that's dominated by line. The stairs of Santorini, Greece. The bonus in the cat, which ironically is a shape. So we have the elements of design here at work. We have line, we have shape, and of course we have color. Now one of the things I want to stress about this image is it is 100% being in the right place at the right time. Meaning that I'm at the staircase, I see it, nobody's walking up and down, I'm, I'm going to just wait. As a good street photographer has learned, if you've got a great location, just wait. Something is bound to happen. This is an active stairway. Somebody's going to be coming up and down. I'm hoping it's going to be the elderly woman in a red dress. But she never shows up. Not that she should, because I don't even know if she lives there. But I do know that I want a pedestrian. And all of a sudden a cat shows up, but it stops at the top of the stairs. And it, it won't move. It just finds me fascinating. It keeps looking up at me. So I'm throwing little rocks at it. it psst, and it's going, what? Finally, a dog comes. The cat bolts. And my cat is here. Right? Oh, boom, two shots. This is one. The other one, the leg is tucked in. It's not nearly as compelling. So I got very lucky. Only two shots. Moving on to a snowstorm. As I mentioned, the light is horrible but yet it's a powerful and effective image because of several things. Line, texture of the snow, and of course, color. This is a 40 minute exposure. 40 minutes. You're thinking, what? Here's why. It was at 39 minutes and 59 seconds that finally a red car showed up. So I waited 40 minutes to get the red car in the cold on a balcony. You learn most people's choices to buying a car are white, gray, and silver. I mean, and black. And occasionally a red. 40 minutes later, a red car showed up. I wanted red. Now, people would say, why don't you just do a gray car and then Photoshop and make it red? Where's the fun in that? I can't experience the cold if I do that. <laughs> I want to be able to have that organic experience. That, that's kind of like trying to eat food on the internet. You know, about looking at a picture and just imagine what it would taste like. I want to know what it tastes like. So now we're on the uh, Ganges River in Varanasi. Guy's rowing his boat and I say, stop right there, we got lines. Let's just see what happens. Let's just see what happens. What's going to happen is people are going to walk on that staircase, not up and down. Well, I shouldn't say that. They will walk up and down. But a woman comes along, didn't take long, and there's your shot. Again, you're focused. You go out and you say, today I'm going to do nothing but look for compositions of line. In this case here, there's the setup. Nikkor, 200 millimeter lens, focusing down on four feathers that my cat had brought me the day before. Not the feathers as much as the whole bird that he had killed. I said, no, this is bad news. It's month of April. It's a female cardinal. Obviously, she must have a nest somewhere, and there will be no 
baby birds. I, was, I really felt bad. So I was angry. Of course, you know what? You, you can't tell a cat not to do that. That's what they do. Put the bird in the garbage. The next day I realized I should have saved it. So I went back out and got it out of the garbage, pulled some feathers, and immortalized it, so to speak, by shooting textures, lines. The color comes, I want to point this out, from the blue spray bottle, which, which was just luck. I sprayed the feathers with water, put the bottle down, and the sunlight going through the feather went, whoa, look at that. Blue on the feathers now. Not Photoshop. In camera, color blue. Whoops. Strongly recommend, if you haven't been there, put it on your bucket list. Go to the Omo Valley. Anybody been to the Omo Valley? It's fabulous. Agreed? Can't get enough of it, right? I go back every year. It's been since 2016. Last year I went back with a whole bunch of fabrics and fingernail polish and lipstick. The Mercy Tribe was absolutely floored and thrilled. All the women, they fought. Give me that, give me that. Started doing their nails and putting lipstick on. I had the fabrics, and they couldn't wait to pose. It was all outside, natural light. But again, in this instance here, it's an image that's predominantly about line. That's it, okay? Same thing here. This is a line photograph, Santorini, Greece. This is an art gallery outside. Funny story about this. The roofs in Santorini are slatted, two by twelves, I mean two by fours, very narrow openings. From about 11 till about 1, the sun's directly overhead, so you have these great shadows. Stupid me, I'm looking at this one morning and I'm seeing these shadows, so what do I do? I race back to the hotel, an hour away, the other end of the island. The front desk hotel manager has a daughter which I learned three days earlier, wants to be a model. So I said, hey, get some clothes on, and we're going to go back here, and I'm going to shoot some pictures of you. Well, I can't be ready till 4. I said, that's fine. 4 o'clock, no problem. We'll have plenty of light. So I go back, and I, I, I can't find this place. I said, well, it was right. The gallery was here somewhere, but there, there's, no, there's no stripes. So I'm thinking, I was confused. And then I realized, oh, the light. Of course, only midday. This is a guy who's been shooting for 40 years. There you go. See, I, I, even I can make those silly mistakes. So I went back the next day with a different model, and I made that photo. Likewise, back to the stairs, lone dog on the stairs again. Lines, lines, lines. All about lines. Light and shadows. We got a guy cleaning the floor in New York City in the Oculus, which is a brand new building, and everybody's photographing it, and also Washington Monument, where one week from today, new president. Yes! Okay. <laughs> Can't wait. And we have Provence, France. Lines again. Where's the shot here? You got one chance to get a picture of line. You're in Hong Kong. Do you see it? Huh? Go ahead and speak up. Tell me where you want to shoot. We're on a workshop together. I'm sorry? The yeah, up here? Yeah, right in there. I agree. Yeah, that's, that's the place I'd go as well. Absolutely. Yep. So I'm there with some students. And they're all, not all, but a few of them saying, but nobody knows it's Hong Kong. <laughs> and I go, well, take the wide shot so you can, you know. But it's some people, it's really important. I want to make sure that they know I was in Hong Kong. And I go, okay, well, take a selfie, you know, in front of the harbor, and then you've got that covered. <laughs> so, anyway, lines in Holland, horizontal lines, vertical lines. By the way, we know without question, because of the line, that those are young trees. Agreed? Those are not 100-year-old trees. Those are babies, because of the height of the line. Okay, that's the power of line. It's a message that goes unspoken, but it, you're, you're making that assumption. These are even smaller. So, remember the importance of line and what it conveys, because it obviously has a message. And one of the things about line, it applies to anything. This is a line, right here in my arm. That's a line. This is horizontal, this is vertical, this is diagonal. He has legs, two lines. We can frame through his legs and get the same photograph of those women. No problem. Why not? Yeah. 
This is on the bridge over by the gold souk. I shot this last month. What luck. This guy is wearing stripes and colors that matches the bridge. Who would, I mean, how do you get that lucky? You know? I was there about an hour, and this guy comes walking through, and I went, no way. No, are you kidding me? And then he does this as he turns a corner. He touches his head. That gesture of a man on the move. Amazing. Got very lucky. I saw this incredible parking structure right near my hotel, the Hyatt place. And I found a willing model. There you go. Put her in the lines. Lines of trees in the forest. Any idea? How did I get this? Did I get lucky and find this small individual jumping through the forest? <laughs> this is not Photoshop, okay? I want to stress. You'll know when it's Photoshop. It's the end of the presentation. <laughs> this is 100% staged, super wide, 1424 Nikkor, at 14. Imagine right about where that black chair is. I'm here, sitting on my bum, and it's a picnic table. And I'm tilting the camera up. Well, if you know the 14 Nikkor, or 14 whatever, that tall forest is going to bend. And on that picnic table is one of my students. And I said, Maya, on the count of three, jump. And at a 500th of a second, we freeze her as she elevates up from the table. That's all there is to it. Using your imagination, OK? Speaking of which, your job is, is to pull that phone book out of the garbage, which we did, and make an incredible image of lines. Well, what's your choice? The paper. Just the torn, tattered paper, and there is your shot. Lines. Now, I want to stress, up until this very shot, every single line you've seen has been horizontal, vertical, or diagonal. Let me introduce you to the curvilinear line. Every one of you in this room has a personality, for obvious reasons, because you're human. If you gave me 20 images and said, this is my best work, you may not appreciate it, you may appreciate it, you may not be aware of it, but I will be making a very quick analysis of your personality. Because every picture you take is a selfie. You've been doing it since day one. Nobody shoots what doesn't appeal to them. It's rare. So what appeals to you, and in that what appeals to you, that body of work, those 20 top images, I can look and determine if you are a line photographer, if you're a texture photographer, if you're shape, pattern, form, color. Color becomes a little bit more intense because then it depends on what colors you favor. But they speak about you as a person. And people who shoot a lot of diagonal lines, and believe me, there's a lot of them out there, have a tendency to be married twice, <laughs> have a very strong opinion about things, they're incredibly decisive, and they're highly driven, motivated people with tremendous amount of goals. Half of them never get accomplished because they move on to another one too quick. They get impatient. They do make great parents in terms of their ability to provide for their kids, but also give them a great deal of safetyness, but they're, they're, they're just difficult at times. Curvilinear people, are quite the opposite. Curvilinear people have a tendency to be a little bit what we call waif, like a waif. Uh, not wife, but waif. <coughs> That's an English word meaning unstable, a little wishy-washy. But they also are these people that wear, and I hate to say this because I, I can't see your feet, thank goodness, but they favor Birkenstocks and granola, and they go to yoga twice a week. Okay? <laughs> that sounds crazy, but there's a lot of truth in this. Curvilinear people are like this. If you say to, to a person who's got a diagonal line personality, say, where are we going tonight? To the movies. What show? Batman. I mean, you, you don't even get this question, and they already have the answer. You ask a person with curvilinear lines, say, where are we going tonight? Well, I don't know. You, te what, you tell me. What, what do you want to do? Well, you want to see a drama, or you want to see a, a, a Western? I don't, I don't care. <laughs> Whatever. And then all of a sudden, you're like, Boy, I don't know if I can be around this person for too long. And yet that same person is the one that you'll pour your heart out to and they go, oh, 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 I feel, oh, oh, I feel for you. So it's not all bad. Usually Kerbal and Line people are also have a very strong spiritual center. The Kerbal and Line is also something that's very symbolic of God. 
very, very symbolic of God in the respect that it is never ending, if that makes any sense. It's also the wind, it's the curving of the earth, the orbits, and all that kind of, anyway, so much for curvilinear lines. Another example, spider webs. You may or may not know this, but the spider web, milk spider in particular, its web is so strong that the army created a synthetic version and it's used for bulletproof vest. Pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. They originally used spun milk spider web to make the vest and realized that the amount of vest they needed would require a lot of spiders. So they made up in the laboratory a synthetic version. Uh, nonetheless, curvilinear line, rainbow. Now I want to really stress the difference here. Rainbow is curvilinear. And our response to them is like, oh, oh. As opposed to, run for cover, diagonal lines, oh my goodness. Okay, so lightning is just the opposite of a curvilinear line in terms of its diagonal nature, it's jagged, it's fierce, whereas the rainbow is calm. And yeah, you can argue, well, it's, it's because it's colors and blah, blah. No, it's not. It's, it's our reaction to the line itself. I know there's thunder in, involved and all that kind of stuff. But more importantly, it has everything to do with the direction of the line and our response to it. So keep that in mind because we're not going to move into texture. Texture. What is texture? Texture is that wall of a house in Chesky Kremlov, Czech Republic. And in front of that house is a red bench. And sitting on that bench just happens to be my 27-year-old daughter, Chloe, who happened to have, unbeknownst to me, a red scarf in her purse. I said, put your scarf on. And she, of course, faced me. And I said, no, turn around. Look at the wall. And she's like, you don't want to take my picture? I go, yeah, from behind. So anyway, sometimes, you know, you have to suffer at my expense. But that's what happens to get a shot like that. And now we're going to go with red hair from the Halloween store and fake eyelashes and throw you in the pool. And then the texture of the water is going to create that effect. Now we're behind the wheel of the car. You've all done this. The rain on the, and you're like, wow, what a great photo. But I can't photograph that. I'm going to drive. Well, do you? <laughs> Maybe you should just reach for the camera real quick. You'd be fast. You know, turn the wipers off so you get accumulation of rain. And as you go into the tunnel, shoot. It's not moving that fast, okay? Anyway, speaking of cars, you can't see it too well from here, but there's our shot right there. A macro lens, by a show of hands, how many of you own a macro? Only three or four of you. Well, Nikon's done a horrible job. You all should be owning a macro. And here's why. I'll show you in a minute. If you had a macro lens, you would make the discovery that there is, without question, 100 photographs a day far beyond your life to be taken. 100. I am absolutely convinced of that. If only, and I mean if only, you did nothing but shoot texture. That's how many textures exist. And again, I want to expand your vision here, so take a look. That's that front bumper of that tow truck sitting on the streets of Brooklyn, New York City. How long that so-called design has been on that front bumper, I have no idea. What motivated me to even look at it? Because I'm curious. I wake up every day and I ask myself, what if, or that deserves a closer look? These kind of makes uh, things make these kinds of discoveries. So with that in mind, let's continue on. This is obvious. You've all been to the Dira. It's still happening, the fish market? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is in Sehat, Saudi Arabia. Not that it matters. But nonetheless, we have texture. We have color just in that little bit of fish. Okay? This is an image of texture. That's it. You can argue and say, well, it's got line, too. Of course it does. Every picture has line. But what's dominating about these images, predominantly in this case, obviously, is texture. You could say, well, there's a lot of color there, too. Yes, it's colorful texture of what, you might ask. Anybody want to make a guess? Because I really don't know. I really, uh, it's a bird. 
Very good. That's all I know. I have no idea what kind of bird this is. No idea. I'm at the Jurong Bird Park in Singapore, and this bird comes out of the bushes and goes right up to my ankles. And I'd walk, and he walks right next to my ankles. He wouldn't leave me. I walked this way. He was with me the whole time. He kept walking. I said, I have no food. I have nothing. Well, as it turns out, uh, I decided, and this was silly. It took me a couple of minutes. I, I realized that, w what am I doing? I should take his picture. So at that point, I stopped, and he stopped. And I had him all to myself. Nikon, D I haven't mentioned this, uh, not that it matters, but Nikon D500 with the 18-300, 3563. Three. I've been using that lens a lot, probably to the chagrin of Nikon, but I love it. <laughs> it's, a, it's such a multi-purpose lens. And we're using it a lot on the streets, as well as in Singapore, and um, here we are in India. A lot of my students in this workshop, they were all focusing on the stairs. And I said, you guys, you remind me of the people who can't see the forest because you're in the trees. Meaning, there's a lot of stuff happening in the water. Texture, color. And in that water, guess what we find? People meditating. Curvilinear people, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. And moving on, what on earth are we looking at? Feel free to spill it out if you know. Chainsaw. Chainsaw, yeah. No, no circular saw either. It is an industrial walkway. Okay. Now, again, macro lens, close-up opportunities. Same thing here, broken glass. I'm at a uh, wrecking yard in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where they have old Milwaukee beer. And that's a very famous brand in the Midwest. The woman, of course, she's been part of the label for I don't know how many years. I'm not a beer drinker, but I know she's been around there for 40 years. So I put a piece of glass over her. Just because I want to do something I haven't been done before, you know. There it is. Texture over her. And uh, moving on. Any ideas? Looks like an eye. Cleopatra. It's just a simple burn barrel. That's it. There it is right there. Okay. That deserves a closer look. What is that? So you walk up there. You got your macro and you go, well, this is interesting. Yes, indeed. Here's one for you. How many of you have topaz, uh, not topaz, I'm sorry, Nick filters? Anybody have the Nick filter suite that Google sells? Nobody has Nick filters. It's okay to admit it. I'm not going to make fun of you. <laughs> yes, I have. Um, here's what I'm saying. This is a plastic tent, obviously. And how many of you see this amazing photo opportunity? Texture. Let's do a macro shot of that texture. Go up close, okay? Nikkor, 18 to 300. It's an incredible lens. It focuses remarkably close. D500, Nikon. I focus really close on that texture of just the plastic. I go all the way to F22. Oh my goodness, I probably just had some fingernails and chalkboard experience when I said F22 by some of you. How many of you despise F22? Anybody? It's okay, be honest. You guys are great. Usually, I get half the class say, oh, I never shoot at 22. Causes lens infraction. Are you sure? Well, that's what I was told. So you haven't done it. Well, no, they said don't do it because it causes lens infraction. I'm saying that's so bad advice. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. Anyway, F22, focus on this with the colors in the background, and you end up with this. Okay? Looks like a painting. Okay? The reason I said Nick Filters is because the Nick Filters has filters that you can put in Photoshop to get this effect. And again, I'm thinking, why would you do that when you can do it yourself? Well, I didn't know I could do it myself or save time. But the problem was, look, that's like telling people that you could be in the Olympics, but you'll have other people run the race for you and take credit. That makes no sense. You can't feel good about yourself. I got gold in the Olympics. Yeah, you're Olympic? No, I had another person run for me. It's like, well, okay. Uh, yeah. Now, the other thing I want to mention, too, which is so important, it's vitally important for the creative process. How many of you are going to take responsibility to image? Because if you're going to walk around and try to find the image without any input from you, 
you're going to have maybe 10% success. If on the other hand, you put yourself in a position where there's potential images, that, that's going to help, but also if you will be part of the process. And what I mean by that is simply this. That leaf was put in that crack by yours truly. I want to stress that. And if you're a nature photographer, and believe me, I've heard, this, I've heard from them, they say, that's not natural. Yeah, and your point is, well, you shouldn't do that. Because? Because it's not natural. Okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I, I've tried this, and no one has yet disputed it. Watch this. This is a natural thing. I bend down, very natural, pick up a leaf. This feels real natural. I put it in the tree. <laughs> there was nothing hard about that at all. I mean, it wasn't like I was contorting my body. It felt very natural. And you do that, and you end up with a shot like this. Okay? Here's my argument. If you're a studio photographer, a food photographer, those two things, fashion, everything you do is so not natural, if you want to use that same argument. You get to put the cake where you want against whatever background you choose and light it from the side in any fashion you want with grids, gels, whatever, okay? And no one says, well, that's not natural. Likewise, you put the bride next to a waterfall. Well, that's not natural. Yeah, but that's different. What's different? Because it's not nature. Just let nature be nature. It's like, oh my goodness. By the way, bonus question. When is the best time, the best time to shoot a vertical? If you know this from my books. Right after the horizontal, exactly. Very good. So, turn the camera vertically and double your success. Okay? Good idea. All right, textures once again. Here we have a texture of a beautiful model covered in cloth, loom cube. Can't live without mine. If you don't have a loom cube, you need to get one. But look what happens. She's, she's assisting. You're saving money. You have the model be your assistant as well. She's undercover. Now you're going really close. Nikkor, 105 millimeter. Right there, okay? Oh, can't wait. Look at this. Okay? That texture, that overlay, makes that feeling. And I've had students say, you know, Nick Filters has that. I said, well, I'm happy for Nick. Okay? I don't own Nick. Do it yourself. Likewise, look at the skin. I mean, the texture. Why do we like to shoot elderly people? You may not realize it, but it's a lot to do with texture. Yeah. There's something to be said about elderly people and the texture of their faces. A lot of texture here. Slow speed. I'm actually moving the camera ever so slightly, just a smidge, at about a twentieth of a second here uh, during a snowstorm. And it is really snowing. In fact, this shot was taken the same day that you saw the red car through the intersection. I lived on a fourth floor apartment in Lyon, France, excuse me, for about ten years. And uh, this is one of the more memorable snowstorms that we had in Lyon one winter. Taken just last month here in Dubai. This is uh, Roxy Ray, a model from Dubai. She's German. Um, you can see here, I want to set this up. I make my own textures if possible. Okay? This is a piece of plexiglass attached with a super clamp to a light stand. Very simple setup. I sprayed it with water. Rain. Okay? Let's go in tight. Let's shoot that eyeball. Look at the strip of light here. Where's that coming from? It's coming from the 4 o'clock in the afternoon, coming through my uh, penthouse Airbnb. Not that I'm trying to spew that I'm a penthouse guy. It just happened to be a, a great deal. And they said it was a penthouse. I went, whoa, cool. So I'm down by uh, Jumeirah Beach, or I mean uh, the marina on a penthouse. And uh, top floor, and the light's coming through, and it's great. So that's my shot right there, OK? Macro lens. Take a look, all right? Yeah. Now, here's where it gets interesting. That same plexiglass goes with me around the world. Okay? And guess what I do with it? I use it in Venice. So I'm out there at 6 a.m. like a lot of other people, because they all do this. You've probably been to Venice, right? And you got this shot without the plexiglass, I'm guessing. Like everybody else, I've done that before. So this time I said, you know, I've been there, done that. What can I do different? <gasps> plexiglass. So I got this plexiglass, and I'm spraying it, and I've got photographers on both sides. They're not part of my group, and they're going, what is he doing? <laughs> and I looked at both of them. I said, you know, 
I wanted it to rain today, so I brought my own rain. And one guy said, that's really stupid. But he didn't see the photo. The other guy saw the photo, and he said, that's really smart. So I, I hope that, uh, that uh, you understand what's happening here. Now I'm in India. Bring the plexiglass with me. Okay, so it goes from Venice, then it goes to Jodhpur, India. Spray it with water once again, and here comes the model. Okay, now what I did is I sprayed it and set this up in my bathroom. And directly behind it is nothing more than some colored lights. A whole string of Christmas lights in a bucket. Turned on, of course. And I end up with a colorful background of lights. Okay, texture once again, a couple of guys playing. This is a noun. 100% noun. Oh, boys playing in, in, on summertime. This is a noun, but it's a little more striking, like so. Okay. So yes, it's a guy playing with the hose and getting sprayed, but it's first and foremost, wow, texture. This is a noun. This is also a noun, but first it's a wow, and then, oh, wow, macaw. Close up. Hmm, interesting. Why? Because of lines and textures and color. Same trip last month, Dubai Marina. You have all the reflections on the water down there. And people were feeding these birds. And I'm there next to them shooting. Texture, texture, texture. Okay? Make it a point, and I must say this earlier get a 105 macro lens and do nothing but texture. Once a day, I'm excuse me, one day a week, a couple hours, just textures. This broken glass of a windshield of a car in a wrecking yard. This is nothing more than a garbage can with something happened to it. I don't know what. This is the side of a 30-yard dumpster that's been rusted. This is nothing more than an old soccer ball that's deflated. And I don't know where the colors came from. And then finally, this is a piece of wood. Each one of these arguably could be a fine art piece of work up on a wall. You could become your signature as the texture photographer. And people are just lining up to buy your work, possibly. I know there's people that do this for a living. Shape and form. You guys know the difference. Shape has absolutely no volume. Form has volume. If you want to lose weight and put yourself in some of these, you know, uh, singles uh, websites, shoot yourself as a silhouette. I can't see how heavy or thin you are. Okay, <laughs> like lose. Well, I can't tell. Assuming you want to keep that hidden. If, on the other hand, you want to show yourself off, then you want to side light yourself, because that will show your form. Okay? Side lighting is form. Backlight, generally speaking, is shape. As an example, backlight. We can only assume, only assume that these are probably boys playing basketball. We make that assumption because I don't see any long hair that you would only associate with women. And secondly, the body shape looks very much male. We don't know for sure, but that's the joy as well as the downside to shape. If you want to use shape to identify a subject, you're in serious trouble. This is how horror movies get away with being so incredible on the first one. When they do a sequel, it's, it's well, you already know what the monster looks like. In the first one, we see a shape go by in the night. We see a, a shape on the wall. It's like, whoo, wow, did, did, I, it looks big. Did you see the fangs on the, oh my goodness. But we haven't seen its form. We haven't seen its texture. Uh, we've only seen the shape. So until the end of the movie, you're on your pins, and, and then they do a sequel. It's like, well, no, this thing is it's not that bad. I saw it. And so they got to really change things up on the sequel. Anyway, there's absolutely zero indication of what color these livestock are. There's no indication at all, it's just a shape. This is in Omo Valley, by the way. My phone is really warm right now, something tells me, yeah, it's on fire. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, 
Anyway, this is in the Omo Valley, and, and this is one of those things where we stopped uh, at uh, around me, myself, and the guide. It was just me and myself. The students hadn't shown up for three more days. And at this point, uh, this was uh, 45 minutes later, but we stopped. I said, you know, let's just stop, stop, because we're going to get the sunset here pretty quick. And uh, there was no livestock, no people. And all of a sudden, right as the sun's going down, these guys were across the street, across the street, and then I moved. I said, are you kidding me? This is like, whoa. So once again, right place, right time, hoping something like this might happen. You've been to Inlay Lake in Myanmar, anybody? Anybody? No? OK. Well, uh, you can do this any night of the week. This isn't locked. This isn't uh, uh, any other, I mean, assuming you have good weather. These guys do nothing but hang out on the lake with old fishermen costumes and the old nets, hoping that you'll pay them money to do a little ballet show. Just want to be clear about that, OK? It isn't like I got lucky and, oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, they're there every night. It's like going to Disneyland. So, But a shape photograph nonetheless. Here's a shape of a stork. Ethiopia, once again. Big lens. I like big lenses, you know, the 1,200 millimeter. I don't have any more, but I did back in the day. And you get big suns like that. 1,200 millimeter with a 1.4 teleconverter. Now, uh, we're going to talk about this later, but this is a Sunny 16 example. Uh, how many of you know about Sunny 16? Anybody? Nobody knows about Sunny 16? You do. And that's it? Back here? Wow. That's a shocker. Well, you guys are in for a treat. Yeah. Okay. Well, Sunny 16 simply means that any photograph that's front lit or side lit is correctly exposed every time at a f16 at the same shutter speed of the ISO. Your meter breaks down, not in the days of digital, because then your whole camera goes down, but back in the days of film, when the camera meter would die, we'd always do sunny 16, assuming it was a sunny day. That's why it's called sunny 16. I don't want you to even think for a moment that it applies to snowy 16 or rainy 16, because it doesn't. It's only sunny 16, OK? And we'll, we'll get more into that a little bit later, OK, uh, as far as how to account for these kinds of exposures. But um, nonetheless, the shape around this form uh, is caused by buildings behind me as the sun's coming up. And again, nothing but shape, sunset. Nothing but shape. This is Kim Motion. Again, we're going to go back to Myanmar. If you want to join me in next November, be my guest. It's a workshop that I have coming up. And you'll meet Kim. He's been throwing his net for me and my students for five years. OK? I want to stress that, OK? The first year, I saw him from the shore. And he was out there fishing. And I said, I'm not going anywhere until this guy comes in. And he came in about four hours later. I, was, I had stuff to do as far as other photos to make. But I kept my eye on him. So I introduced myself. And I said, would you mind uh, throwing your net for me and a couple of students tomorrow morning? And he said, I'm here every morning. What time? I said, well, sunrise. He said, well, I'm here at 4. And um, I said, OK, well, sunrise is at 520. So we'll see you at 5-ish. He said, no, no, you've got to be here at 4. <laughs> I go, why? Well, because I'm going to row out to the lake, and I'm going to get set up. And I OK, fine, sure. So we rented a boat. Uh, we, we're, we're in a boat, as he's in his boat. Coming, his boat, by the way, on this particular day, <laughs> developed a leak. And he, and he said, we've got to hurry, because I'm, I'm taking in a lot of water here. I said, no, that's too bad. We're going to keep shooting. <laughs> anyway, we bailed him out, no problem. But more importantly, he got 50 bucks for the first session. I didn't realize I overpaid him by about $45. Okay? So he makes about that in a month, 50 bucks, which is great. So I'm more than happy to do it. So I do two Myanmar workshops a year. And every year, uh, when I come twice a year, you can always tell uh, he's in a better mood when I show up. Because he knows he's getting a month's salary for basically an hour's worth of work. And uh, he's been doing this for five years. And he now, because he has WhatsApp and he has a phone, he always texts me and, you know, Merry Christmas. Good to, you know, you're coming back, I hope. And yes, I'll see you again. So COVID really messed things up, though. We didn't get to go this year. Anyway, what's wrong with this photograph? Please tell me that you've made this mistake countless times. If you haven't, then you got very lucky. But the biggest mistake people make when shooting silhouettes is they make the mistake and not think like a meter. And this is important. Your light meter sees light and dark simultaneously. Excuse me. Your light meter does not see light and dark simultaneously. It sees when given a choice. It always chooses bright over dark. So 
it looks at a scene like this and says, well, it's pretty bright. You look through the viewfinder and you think, yeah, so what? It's bright, sun's going down, but I can see these guys from head to toe. No problem. Click. And this is what you get in your monitor. You go, wow, what happened to the guys from the, from the chest down? They disappeared. Well, they disappeared because your meter got influenced by all this. The trouble is if you meter for this down here, this is going to go way overexposed. So what do you do? You Photoshop it later. <laughs> no, you go down low. And that elevates everybody else, and subsequently, you get the shot. Yeah, simple as that. I've had students in these workshops. I say, everybody get down on your knees and belly. And they're going, in the sand? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Well, does anybody have a blanket or a towel or something? I'm thinking, you're kidding me. We are camping with these people, and you're worried about a towel in the sand. Well, no towels, so they didn't get the shot. Here again, backlit. I told this girl as she walks towards me to kick up the, the wheat. Give me an attitude. So she did. And that accounts for why there's dust. It's a group of photographers at a workshop. The sun's going down. I said, everybody line up, take a selfie. And that's what we did. This is a big puddle, 14 to 24 millimeter Nikkor. It's about uh, maybe, not that big, it's about four, four meters wide. But at the edge, it just becomes huge. Shape, again, 600 millimeter Nikkor. And now we go into form, okay? Here's an idea that happened the day before. I'm in Jodhpur, I see this woman come around the corner and boy, she's, she's quick, she's gone. I went, oh man, that would have been a really cool shot. So I hired a model to stand there so I could take this picture, just half of a face with the blue bowl. And you can see it right there, okay? Just kind of peeking around the corner. Now we have form. Form is depth, it's volume, okay? Because we have a, a sense of this person, just like we do here. Um, there's a front, there's a back, there, there's volume to this because of the po posing, of it, especially in this case where we're side lit, okay? So now we move away from shape and going into form, and I want to stress, nine times out of 10, not always, but nine times out of 10, form is a side lit exposure. In this case here, we are s somewhat overcast, but still predominantly side light. And you can see we're lighter on this side than we are on that side. The only problem with this picture is I can't get out of a busy background. What can I do? I'll pull out my three square foot, or one square foot, no, let's start over. One square meter black cloth. And I will ask another person, maybe him, I don't know, excuse me. Can you, do you mind doing me a favor, just stand behind that guy and hold the black cloth for me? Yeah, sure. And sure enough, now we've got a clean background. Okay? It costs you about four bucks. You go to the fabric store and you buy a piece of black cloth. It weighs nothing, put it in your camera bag. It's an instant studio for shots like these. Okay? Likewise, same idea here, black cloth and the motion that you're seeing is caused by a large necklace. The makeup's coming from the makeup artist that we hired and took to Ethiopia with us. And uh, this is Ricardo. I've, been, I've known him for four years now. He's at the Caro tribe. And great kid. Um, anyway, he, he couldn't wait to do this. And so this necklace, I'm, I'm literally here tossing it. You can see the video on Instagram if you want to follow it. Um, and you see what's happening. And then at a fifteenth of a second, the motion is captured. But he holds still. So, okay. What's wrong with this picture? Want to tell me what's wrong with it? Maybe nothing. Maybe you like it. I got a problem with it. I'm sorry? Yeah, I agree. Too centered. We have some distraction up here that has nothing to do with this. This is a great light right here. Agreed? So many times I've told students, you're two steps away from a compelling image. What do I mean by that? I mean walk two steps closer. If you can't do that, then zoom closer. Well, I'm already at 200. OK, then walk. Well, I don't want to make them uncomfortable. I'll crop it later in Photoshop. <laughs> I've had a student, and this happens a lot. This is the shot, and I actually duplicated it 
for the benefit of the presentation. This is what she had. I said, you're not close enough. She said, you know, I, I kind of thought so. But that's OK. I'll, I'll just crop it when I get home. I said, we're here. The girl's right there. Let's just do it. Well, I don't want to take up her time. Oh, yeah, she's in a real hurry. She's got a dental appointment. You know, I mean, come on. So trust me, she can't wait to be photographed over and over and over. So we're going to just go in closer. And there's your shot. Again, light, no question. But it's about texture as well. Um, it's about, uh, uh, I'm just curious, light, texture, and, and pattern, and form, and sh uh, every, yeah, color. Wonderful. Same with this. Okay, what's happening? Overhead, we have a lattice ceiling outside on a deck. And we ask the model just to simply go up against the wall where the shadows are falling on it. Easy stuff. Easy stuff. Now, here's the challenge. I'm going to take you here. We're at the workshop, and I'm telling you, oh, I'm so thrilled to be here. <laughs> You're like going, I paid to come here. To do what? What am I possibly going to ask you to shoot? Any guesses? Huh? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, well, these are obvious. And I'm saying you can shoot anything but red. OK, so far, so good. Yeah. yeah it's really just this. But I want you to see what happens. Again, remember, this is that fine art stuff. So there it is. All right? Pretty much anything can be turned into a compelling image if you follow the principles of composition. And those principles start with you being on the lookout for lines, textures, form, pattern, shape, and color, and so on. OK? And uh, there we go. Again, more form, more form again. You can see the depth here. It's, just, it's, it's intense. Okay? It goes from very close to very far. This is line. This is shape. But more than anything, it's form. There's tremendous volume in this picture, which, again, which is what form does. These were taken right here in Dubai, down at the fish market. But I'm not done. This is obvious. It's an easy shot. Everybody can do this. I want to stress, though, and we'll talk more about this in a minute with pattern. If you're going to do pattern, make sure it's edge to edge all the way through. The minute you have a, a gap or an empty spot, it's as if you called attention, ironically, thinking of this as a choir. Okay, everybody's singing the same tune. And then with one fish missing, there's a gap. It's like, oh, somebody called in sick. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I didn't want you to know that. Well, how do you fix that? You simply move in closer or you move fish. It's like, oh, I, that's not natural to move something. <laughs> well, anyway, get in closer. I've said this many, many times before. You leave food on the table. Okay? You don't work the subject. This is okay. It's okay. And you're all happy with yourself. Oh, I'm so happy I came here. I'm really liking this shot. And I'm thinking, well, you're just getting started. Well, what else would I do with it? Work it. Work different designs. Get closer. You know, talk to the guy, which I did. I said, do you mind if I play with your fish? <laughs> he said, no, as long as you don't disturb my customers. I said, no problem. So you, you're very sensitive to that. And then you make your own arrangements, OK? Likewise, I love to shoot letters. You may know that from some of my books. And uh, letters are a great thing in terms of uh, form and shape. Uh, letter N, and of course, uh, W, and uh, S. They're just random, OK? And then when, at the end of the day, you get yourself a whole alphabet, OK? Now, you might be thinking, what are you going to do with that? I don't know. I have no idea. So, but I, I'm ready. If there ever needs the day when I have to write a ransom note, I got it, OK? <laughs> I do have some ideas. You could take each one of these. I found a company in America. There's probably one in the Middle East, too, that'll print on cotton. So I'm thinking, why not do a patchwork quilt with letters? Could be cool. Then sell them. You can also turn these into messages. And I've done that. I've, ha I've sent messages, happy birthday greetings to people with random letters. And I start in the middle. So I go H-A-P-P-Y-B-R, and then coming out like that. And when it's all said and done, it doesn't say happy birthday. You look at it and it says, wish you were not here. <laughs> but it's really happy birthday. But the letter gets turned around. You know, it's funny how that works. All right, pattern. How are we doing on time? Break. 
Break. OK, go have a break for. OK, 15 minutes. OK, 15 minutes. Sounds good. I am thrilled to be here. Yes, I am. No, no, no. I was here in December up until the 20th, and then I went home for Christmas and came back on the 2nd of January. So, and then Tuesday I go to Kenya. So, Kenya. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Going to the Mass Night Mara. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Live still going. Oh, live stream still going. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Whoops. Okay, so.
Fired up. Okay, yes. good. We are live streaming again. All right, good. Hey, until next time, you keep shooting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, pattern. What do we know about pattern? If you are a pattern photographer, the odds are you are a member of a large family. It's very telling. People who shoot pattern a lot usually come from big families. And if they don't come from big families, believe it or not, they're only children. And they want to have a big family. But people who have three or four kids, they don't shoot a lot of pattern. It reminds them of the chaos. Okay? Not chaos. I mean, it's hard to describe. This has just been my experience. I, I had a presentation here just yesterday morning at a different location, and uh, we got to this one girl who was showing her stuff for a critique, and I said, you come from a big family, really big family. And she went, you don't know me. I said, well, yes, I do. You have a really big family. She said, yes, I do. There's 12 of us. How do you know that? Because everything you shoot is pattern. Well, what that means is, is pattern is a symbolic vision of family, unity, we're all on the same page, we all go the same way, you know, it's, it's just big, giant, happy family, community, okay? So keep that in mind as you look at pattern. Recognizing as well that in order to get the pattern, you need lines, you need textures, you need shapes, you need forms. So pattern is the end result of a number of those things. This is not the finished photo, but this is an example of a person who wants me to believe that they're shooting a pattern. It's like, well, you didn't finish it. So what are you talking about? Look at all that pattern. And I'm saying, yes, and look what's not important. <laughs> well, I'll crop it later in Photoshop. <laughs> crop it now. Let's go in here and do one of these. You know, just cut it right down the middle, right in there. Let's just really make something graphic out of this. And sure enough, that's what we do. Okay? But predominantly, that's pattern. It's light coming through here. Now, obviously, you can't do this photograph on a cloudy day. Can't be done. So there is some merit. Light is everything. Okay, <laughs> this is an example. You can't live without it. There's pattern. That's family. That's pattern. Pattern in Africa. Pattern in Bhutan. Pattern, pattern, pattern. Pattern of flowers. Flower market. Pattern of used paintbrushes. I happened to be at a high school making this little talk, and as I'm leaving. I just happened to see this janitor with a big box of brushes, and I go, whoa, where are you going? He says, oh, I'm getting rid of these. I said, no, you're not. You're going to put them in my car. <laughs> oh, I, I, I can't do that. We're not authorized. But you're throwing them away. Well, yes, yeah, because they're, they're no good. I said, well, give them to me. So I had to go to the principal to get permission to take stuff from the school. So I brought them home, and I threw them away eventually. This is about four years ago. But what a find, huh? Pattern. Pattern flamingos. Pattern, 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 pattern. And then, what's cool about pattern is, this is taken in Dubai, just up the street. Uh, from the rooftop shooting down, obviously. Um, waiting for something to break up the pattern. In this case, the person in red, of all things. Took about an hour. But me and four other people who were on that same rooftop got the same shot, including my great friend, Sabode Shetty. So we argued over who was going to post it first. <laughs> I think he did, actually. Here's another example. This is a bunch of PVC pipe. I'm in Agra, India. And I saw this, and I said, oh, that would be so cool if there was a worker. But nobody was around. So I went inside the shop, and I said, can I get one of your workers to come out here and sit and drink from a red thermos? Now, I realize that's a hard request, but the red thermos I actually saw when I went inside sitting on the counter. And I said, if somebody could drink that, it would be great. And they went, do what? I said, just have them come out here and drink it, because it's a really nice photo. And that's what happened. That's how this picture happened. In other words, you need to be part of the creative process. You got the idea? Look at that background. Oh, now I need to find somebody. Well, it just so happened I got a model with me in Chandichuk, Chandichuk, uh, Delhi. And we went around doing shots like this. There's a nice little doggy. Isn't that the cutest little thing? Bunch of boxes. And he found a little home amongst all that. Pattern, and he breaks up the pattern. When you have all this pattern, what happens is, obviously, there's only one dog. And now the dog becomes a focus. Think of it this way. 
The pattern of boxes is the background singers. The dog's the lead singer. Okay? Same idea. All right? Pattern. All that broken dirt, mud, cracks, and boom. There's the model. Same idea here. Now, this is a challenge. What are we looking at? Huh? It's nothing more than reflections of color inside big pots. Okay? Take a look. See that? That's fine art. $5,000. <laughs> yeah. All right. People in Agra blew up my WhatsApp. I posted this, and they said, where, where in Agra is this? I live here. I've never seen that in my life. They said, it's on the river. They do longer there every day. No. Yeah. And you get shots like this. And then they go, no, I lived here 11 years. I've never seen that. Well, I've been there seven times, and I've seen it every time I've been there. You walk across the bridge, along the river, and you shoot down. They're there every day. So, isn't it amazing? Things are happening right now here in Dubai that are really creating some compelling photographs, and you don't know that because of the biggest reason of all. Familiarity breeds contempt. That's why you go to other places, to shoot. There's nothing to shoot in Dubai. That's why I go over there. I go to Doha, because it's better. I go to uh, Daman, I go, I go to Oman, I go to Muscat. It's not because there's anything better, it's because it's not familiar. And just like most anything else, when your mind is inspired by something new, you feel compelled to photograph it. But you wake up every day here in Dubai, people unlike myself who don't, I get here and I go, man, you guys got this oasis of photography here. You're like, what? There's nothing here to shoot. What are you talking about? You've been here in July? Yeah, I've been here in July. <laughs> it's a little harder to shoot, but there's plenty to shoot in July. So there's another pattern right there. It's a pattern of rice. Now, if I just can find the right person, it's a great studio background. So I go hunting, Chinese chuck, find a guy. Anybody? Help. Anybody want to come over here? Ten minutes, okay? There's my guy. Whoa, lucky. He's wearing orange. Yeah, amazing. I couldn't get him to do anything. I'm talking to him. He speaks English. But as soon as I put the camera in my eye, he shut his mouth. Here. <laughs> and I said, so how long have you been doing this? And then I put the camera in his, oh, I've been doing this for about, oh. yeah. <laughs> One of those kind of subjects. So anyway, it was okay. No, no complaints. News flash. You have a flash. How many of you have a flash? How many of you use a flash? Keep your hands up if you still use it. Okay. I'm going to give you a really hot tip here. For those of you that don't know this, there's only two reasons to use your flash. And I'm only going to share with you one. Because to me, it's the best reason of all. You have two reasons to use a flash. Reason number one is because you want to kill the ambient light and do nothing but have a flash exposure. That's a good reason, but it's not one of my reasons. My reason is number two. First of all, when I say kill the ambient, that means you literally want to do something like F22, 50 ISO, 250 of a second, and take a picture outside on a cloudy day. And you do that, I guarantee you, you're going to have a black frame. It's going to be so underexposed, you won't see nothing. Perfect. That's what you want, because now you're going to light the subject up in front of it with your flash, and it's as if you have dropped a black background behind them, because you've created a severe underexposure of the ambient light. No, I'm suggesting instead that you do one to two stops underexposure of the ambient, and then use your flash. Okay? TTL, by the way. TTL. Your flash has never cared, never will, never has, never will care about the shutter speed. It has nothing to do with the flash exposure. Zero. Your flash exposure is 100%. Oh. Break. Break. <laughs> Diet Coke. Okay. There we go. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Okay. Your flash has never cared about shutter speed. Never has, never will. Because it has nothing to do with the exposure. Your flash has algorithms. It went to school to learn these algorithms. 
aperture. What's the aperture, Brian? What's the ISO, Brian? Tell me, tell me, because I went to school to learn all this, and they're all embedded inside me, in that computer in the flash. So he said, well, we're going to be doing F11 with 400 ISO. Flash says, no problem. Got you covered. I'm in as long as it's 3 to 14 feet, I'll take the correct flash exposure. That's TTL. This is why I'm using TTL, because it went to school to learn all this. I don't have to do anything manual anymore. So I wrote a whole book about flash years ago. And I said, only use your flash in manual. Now I don't do that anymore. I'm TTL. I'm like Joe McNally. I'm a TTL guy. I'm a convert. Okay? It's like going from Buddhism to, I don't know, Christianity. Who knows? But nonetheless, I'm no longer manual flash. I'm TTL. And I'm happy to admit it. If you're using manual flash, I don't understand you. And you're talking to a guy who used to be committed to manual flash. So please follow my lead. It's so much easier. Meaning this, you set your camera. This is the important part. You still want to use the camera in manual. You cannot do this in aperture priority, shutter priority, or program. Camera must be in full manual mode. At this point, you say to yourself, what do I have to do to get to a two-stop underexposure? What's the subject? Let's just hypothetically make one right here, OK? <coughs> I'm down low, shooting up. I like the design behind this woman, metering off the sky behind her, because I want a correct exposure for the ambient. So not surprising, it's F16 at a 200th of a second with 100 ISO. OK, put the flash on, TTL. Flash says, aha, I see you're at F16. No problem. As long as the subject's 3 to 12 feet, I will get a correct exposure with the flash. Now, how does it know how to do that? This is the amazing thing. Inside that little red window of your flash, just below the flash head, is an infrared beam. And the infrared beam shoots out as you press the shutter down at a 100,000th of a second, strikes this woman in the face, comes back and says, we've got a subject 4 feet away. And the flash says, OK, I'll adjust the power for four feet. Boom, and the flash fires, and subsequently lights her face up. So my ambient exposure is F16 and 200. That's for back here. The flash does the face. OK, so far so good? Boy, this projector is really lighting up these dark exposures. <laughs> Nonetheless, this is normally quite dark. And as a result, no flash. You would not normally see this, but it's, it's pretty bright. So now we put a flash behind for a hair light and a flash in front. Doesn't matter. They're both on radio controlled triggers and they're both TTL, and boom, this is what you get. Okay? Front and back. Sunflower. Flash it. Oh, wait a minute. What happened? I, just, I forgot to put it in there. All right, flash these kids. There you go. All right. There's the sunflower. Hey, it's a little out of order. Sorry about that. OK. Just a simple jump. Two stops under on the background. Make that sky really ominous. Oh, foreboding. Oh, it's a dark day. This is like a Stephen King sky. You know, the monsters are coming. Gorgeous. Sun's going down in an hour. What can we do with that? Not only can you use a flash, as we just described, but you can also change the color of the flash with a gel. So let's put a red gel on, come back in an hour, shoot an ambient exposure for New York City, and have a flash right here to light up gorgeous. Take a look. OK? Ah, see, now we're talking. OK? Ah, news flash. Use it. Sunny 16 rule. Here's the rule. If you want to take a picture of that, be my guest. The Sunny 16 rule means at F16, at a hundredth of a second with 100 ISO, will get you a correct exposure every single time as long as the subject is sunny, frontlit, and sidelit. But not backlit. Okay? Frontlit. And I want to stress, I, don't, I didn't have enough room to write this down. This only works 90 minutes after sunrise and about 60 minutes before sunset. Okay? Before 90 minutes, it's not quite bright enough. But 90 minutes, no problem. 
So let's look at some examples. But I want us also before we do, because people make this mistake. And this is the unfortunate thing about what's happening in the digital world today. Everything's becoming so automated that the understanding of the progression of a correct exposure gets lost on a lot of people because they don't know how to do the math. Okay? There was a time when all there was on a lens was 22, 16, 11, 8, 5, 6, 4, 2, 8, and 2, and 1.4. Okay? There was no third stops. There was no half stops. So those became what I call the master numbers, just like a thousand, a five hundred, a two fiftieth, a hundred twenty fifth, a sixty, thirty, fifteenth, eighth quarter, half, and one. Those were the master numbers. So if you were at F sixteen at a hundred and twenty fifth of a second, which is you didn't have a hundredth back in the old days, Sunny sixteen, you wouldn't be doing that. You'd get as close as possible. So here's my point: Kodachrome sixty four slide film would be F sixteen at a sixtieth of a second for Sunny sixteen. Fuji Chrome 100, yes, you could do F16 at 100. Kodachrome 25 would be F16 at a 30th of a second because there was no 25th of a second. Okay? So nowadays, people get confused and I'm thinking, well, what, I, I don't want to do 16, 16, 16 because I don't want to do a 16 depth of field. You don't have to. Do the math. 16 at 100 is correct. But so is F11 at 200, and so is F8 at a 400, and so is 5, 6 at 800, and so is F4 at a 1600. The cumulative value of those exposures are identical. People often say to me, what should my exposure be? And my answer is, it should be correct. Because <laughs> you have six choices. Every exposure has six choices. Minimum. 18 if you count third stops. These three exposures are exactly the same in terms of quantitative value. So keep that in mind. So sunny 16, let's take a look. This is not sunny 16. This is Nikon's, Canon's, Fuji's, Sony's inability to take a sunny 16 exposure. The dynamic range of the cameras today, especially in auto, are extremely vast. The human eye sees roughly 16 stops. Cameras today pushing it, but do really, really good around 9. Some go to 11. That's not good. It's good, but it's not good. Because it takes sunny 16 out of the equation. In the old days of film, if I do a sunny 16 here, it's nothing but that sunlight recorded and everything is going to go pitch black. So in matrix mode with Nikon, Nikon says, oh, wow, we got black and black, and dark shadows, and a big strip of light. Don't you worry, Brian. I'll average it all out for you. I'll go a little hot on the white and bring the shadows up. I say, no. I'm going to go manual exposure, 16 at a hundredth of a second with 100 ISO. Then I get this, sunny 16. And I'm going to work this all day long. People are coming through that cracks. Here comes another person. Here comes another person, and so on. Here we got Sunny 16 at a church. Uh, it's uh, Lo uh, Lolly Bell, Ethiopia. The rock churches, seven of them. Okay, these guys are in shadows. She's in the sun. His turban's in the sun. His turban's in the sun. But these guys are all in shade. Sunny 16. That means they're going to go dark. Likewise, DHL. I'm waiting. I'm going to go up here. Get a reflection right here. Got the window. Got that. Oh, I just need somebody to come out of the shadows and get into here before they hit the sun. That's it. Street photography, you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And finally, somebody shows up. There you have it. Okay? He's dark because he's not in the sunlight. Obviously, he's in the shadow. As soon as he steps out here, we're going to see who he is. No problem. She is a student. These are tourists. This is in Burano, Italy. You've all been to Burano? Anybody? Most colorful island in all of Europe. 45-minute ferry ride from Venice. Two-mile radius fishing village, an island, and every other house is a different color. So that's the same woman we saw jumping from the picnic table in the woods three years later. She still can jump. <laughs> this is a Millennium Park in Chicago. He's in the foreground shadow. 
The background is a illuminated ice block, almost like a billboard, but it's an art installation. Newsflash, you can use slow shutter speeds. I can't tell you enough how many people do not have any idea about slow shutter speeds. If anything, they avoid them like the plague. Oh, I don't, I don't want to use a slow speed or it won't be sharp. What's wrong with not having everything sharp? Why wouldn't you want to take advantage of motion? And here's an example. Slow shutter speed on a tripod. You have a willing subject. Uh-oh. OK. Uh-oh. What happened? We got our audio guy around, our video guy. I think we just had it lost. It, but maybe it's, no, it's definitely, uh, well, I'll keep you guys. Oh, it's back. OK, good. Uh, I said Steve. I said Stephen King earlier. Maybe I awoke the ghost. OK, so here we are in Hong Kong. Uh, Nat, do me a favor. Just go across the street. Hold still. Hold the camera. And in the meantime, whew, traffic, OK? Quarter second exposures. This is a bus. Whew, light change is green. Going really fast. Through the bus window, we see pedestrians waiting for the light to change. That's it. OK. Likewise, student shooting Nancy, a student. Big open window, wind blowing. I'm behind here with a reflector to fill a little bit of light. And what are we doing at a slow speed? Watch your hair. Take a look. Fifteenth of a second. Nancy will hold still for you. No problem. No problem. OK? Just a little faint, slow speed. Fifteenth of a second. Fisheye lens, obviously. I don't know of any other lens you'd want to use. You're at the ocean. You want to make fisheye in celebration of the fish. <laughs> or in that case, starfish. You're in the beautiful Moab Park, Moab, Utah. Arches. And I'm telling you, we got traffic. Let's take a slow speed of that. It's like, ooh, traffic? No, but it's not natural. I mean, it's, oh, it's ugly. It's, they shouldn't be here. I disagree. They're there. Like you, you drove, you got there by a car yourself. Let's photograph the traffic as they're leaving the park. Why not? Slow speeds of water, ocean stuff, OK? This is over in Iceland. Again, the opportunity to shoot with slow speeds, people don't do it nearly enough, and they should. If nothing else, just experiment. Here we're up at Charles Bridge, up in the tower, shooting down on a typical July summer touristy day in Czech Republic, the city of Prague. And you get lucky. A few people aren't moving much. Okay, Everybody else is kind of in the mood. What you're doing here shutter speed wise, you're doing half second exposures. There's a lot of exposures you're throwing away. A lot. But then out of the 100, you get this one. You don't show the 99. Okay, That's the key. You just show the one. There's no point in showing the 99. What, 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 what purpose would that serve? Here you're shooting a rodeo at a slow speed. Why would I do that? Because normally you're going to freeze action, right? OK, you've got it covered. You did the freezing action shots. Before you leave, do some slow speeds. Can so, I ask a yes. Do you use the NDs sometimes? Sometimes. Sometimes. But my NDs are limited. I only have a 0.6 and a 0.3. Can you advise on each one you use on? Uh, so far, none of these. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, my apologies. I, uh, that's, uh, you, you, I, you made a liar out of me. This one I use an NDO. Yeah, because of the time of day. Uh, that one, that one I did. And this one, uh, no, this was a 0.6. Yeah, 0 0.06, which is only two stops. So there's a 0 0.03, 0 0.06, 0 0.09, 1 1.2, and, and so on. But this is the 0 0.06, which is just two stops. And uh, oh, I should mention, I had a polarizer on plus the, the neutral density. So it's really four stops. Two for the polarizer, two for the neutral density. So this is a four stop altogether. So, OK? Um, OK, this was fun. This was fun. That's me and my friend Philippe. Obviously, we're not having a good day. We, you know, our faces are, <laughs> we haven't eaten for a couple of weeks. <laughs> so funny story here. Almost 
turned into something tragic. It's about one in the morning. This is a what's called the Ruth Tunnel in Lyon, France. On the hood of the car is a Bogan suction cup with a ball head. Attached to that is my Nikon D3 and a fisheye lens and a radio trigger attached to the hot shoe. And inside this car, I'm firing the camera as we go through the tunnel, shooting two second exposures as we're going through. Just click, click, click. One in the morning. We made about four or five passes. Then I finally got out of the car and just, you know, there's the camera and checked to make sure the pictures were good. And they were good. There's nothing else holding this camera on, by the way. So you hope that the suction cup works. Okay? And it did. But here's my point. Before there, as we pulled over, and I'm just about to get out of the car, we had five police cars jam us in and guns drawn and told us to get out of the car and lay down. We went, what in the hell? So we did. And now we're being asked all sorts of questions and we're being even kicked, you know, like, I told you not to move. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and finally, you can get up. Now, what are you doing? I said, I'm a photographer. You can see the camera on there. I'm just taking pictures. I'm, I'm actually writing a book about shutter speeds and blah, blah, blah. To make a long story short, four years before this, still to this day unsolved, there was a series of bank robberies in Paris by masked men wearing skeletal masks. We were being observed, because there's surveillance video cameras all over France, going through the tunnel four or five times. <laughs> because we were practicing our getaway to rob the bank the following morning. <laughs> That's what the cops were thinking. So we finally convinced them that wasn't the case. And the funny part was, one of the detectives came to and signed up for my Provence workshop the following year. <laughs> so. I got a customer out of the deal. <laughs> you never know. All right. Now, the last element of design, and this is arguably, for some, is color. And so I've saved this for last because I want you to appreciate what color can and cannot do and how it works and how it functions and all that. Is anybody here committed to black and white? Because if you are, you may want to leave. <laughs> OK. Appreciate your staying. Speaking of which, before we move on, on the subject of speed, panning is another element of slow speed stuff that will frustrate you to no end, but I still strongly recommend you should do panning. It's another excuse to get up and think, I don't know what to shoot today. I got a great idea. Do panning. You'll never, ever, ever, ever get tired of doing panning, but you'll be frustrated probably by no other technique than panning because it's really hit and miss. It's one of those 100 shots and you get one if you're lucky, sometimes 200, okay? But oh, it's a wonderful feeling when it happens. So with that in mind, let's begin this process of color. And just I want to share with you, not that you haven't seen color already, but here's more images of color. This is Burano, Italy. This is in India. Here we're in Myanmar at a textile factory. This is a funny story because the young girl, when I was photographing her dad, and her mom and her dad's brother, she wanted no part of it. So she initially had jumped through the window and disappeared. So I'm shooting them, just the three of them, and all of a sudden she decided somehow, her mom told me she had this idea that I was going to capture her spirit. So she figured out that somehow I could penetrate the walls. So she, she decided to just leave the building altogether. And so she came flying out of there. I had the presence of mind, thank goodness, to keep shooting. And it's one of those unusual, what's going on in this picture? Now you know, OK? She's fleeing, she's fleeing the photographer. Um, <laughs> OK, here's an example of a noun. There's no mistaking this image. It's the car. And yet, you want to convince me that you're on a mission to shoot color. Say, oh, I'm so happy with this brand. Look at my color image. I'm going, it's a car. Yeah, I know, but isn't it great? Look at those colors. It's like, well, no, it's a car. If you don't want me to know it's a car, not that you don't want me to know, but I'd rather not spend time looking at this and realizing it's a 57 Chevrolet Bel Air. 
I don't, I don't want to know that. I just, just show me the colors. Okay, going closer. And you end up with this. Okay? Now that is a design of color and texture and line. Once again, get rid of the noun, go for the adjective. Okay? See that little square? This is you. You're going to Holland. Oh, I'm going to get wide angle shots of tulips. Why? Just do one. Just do a little close up. One will say everything needs to be said about the beautiful, colorful tulips of Holland. No problem. Okay? Likewise, here we have a guy who's uh, obviously during COVID. This is on election night at Times Square in New York City. And uh, he's waiting in a traffic light. And directly behind me is a huge, giant, lit, neon American flag reflecting in the car. And to me, it's, it's, it says a lot about the country. USA, COVID, you know, yeah, he doesn't look happy. This is in Santorini, again, at a small village. Uh, there's 56 cats that a lady feeds every morning. I know this village well, so I took the students there. Ahead of her arrival, the cats are all waiting here on these stairways. Obviously, there's only one at this particular stair. But nonetheless, she shows up. She opens up her cupboards, and she feeds them, and they just 56 cats. So it's pretty impressive. Anyway, no question about this image. I'm holding up a red piece of cloth behind this lady. I have black, I have red, I have a few other colors as well. I travel with black cloths. The obvious photograph here, if your assignment is color, is what? You guys have this park in Dubai, the umbrella park. Yeah. This is in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. And just, you know, shoot straight up, sunrise, or sun itself. The cover of my book, if you are familiar with it, Understanding Color, this is the origins of that book, cover. I saw this freshly painted store, Sunday afternoon, Mexico, Guadalajara. I sat, I just sat on the curb. I said, I'm just going to wait. There's people walking in front of that store, I don't know what's going to happen. About 45 minutes into it, and I just went, oh, this is incredible. What happened? That's what happened. <clears throat> this wasn't planned. I don't know who the kid is, but he is on the cover of my book. Now that begs the question, perhaps, if I don't have a model release, how do I get away with that? Because the courts have ruled, at least in America, where it matters, because that's where the book's published, that for educational materials, a model release is not required. There's no commercial value to this. I'm not saying little boys on the streets of Mexico are drug dealers. I'm not saying anything. There's nothing disparaging. I'm not suggesting that uh, this boy is going to grow up and be the world's greatest soccer player. That would be wrong. I, I, I'm not saying anything. I'm simply using this photograph as the cover on a book about color. That's it. So here we are at a junkyard. I got boxes of Pringles, paint can, and a old member of the old Milwaukee. What am I doing with all this? Well, I'm using this as a platform to put my color on, which is reflecting in some scratches on that metal truck and end up with pictures like this, okay? We've all seen this on pavement when it rains, leaky oil from a car, but make it not so apparent. So in other words, get in closer and look for color. Now here's my question to you. Color in its whole and composition. This is pretty profound to witness this. It's a table, a pink table. Does this table feel more voluminous, or does this table feel more voluminous? Which one feels heavier? The yeah, the darker color, OK? So does this feel very stable? Does that feel stable? More so, OK? The power of color and how it influences us. It does impact us from what we wear, from how we uh, design and, and uh, decorate our houses. It's, it's amazing. Simple shapes in pink, simple shapes in red. So keep that in mind as we go forward here. There's a blue bridge. This is in Tampa Bay, Florida. This bridge changes colors every eight seconds. Now it's blue. Now it's red. It feels to some, heavier, more solid as a red bridge. 
Likewise, we have green apples. Or we have red apples. The red apples should feel closer to you. I don't mean closer like poetic. <laughs> I mean physically closer. Okay, Take a look. There's the green. There's the red. The reason for that is because red is a more advancing color than green. Green's recessive. Red is advancing. Contrary to popular belief, I don't know how many of you are popular believers, but red is not the most advancing color on the spectrum. Yellow is. But we perceive red as being more advancing for the simple reason I just described, because it's denser. Yellow is lighter. But the fact is, on the light spectrum, yellow travels further than red. So why don't we have yellow stop signs? Because we don't experience in them with authority. Like we don't experience pink in the same way. So red is the stop sign. Okay. Where does color come from? This will be a real shock to you. I didn't know this until I researched this book. All these years, I just took color for granted. Color that we see, the colors that we see, doesn't matter what it is, and I'll explain the reasons why, is rejected color. The world is made up of atoms, molecules, and neurons, and protons, and all that kind of stuff. I'm not a scientist, so if I'm getting this out of order, my apologies. But I can tell you this much. Out in the universe, you have these light spectrums of color that come down to Earth. And like a delivery truck, like a food truck, it comes across the orange and says, boy, we got all the colors of the rainbow here. What are you hungry for? And the orange says, anything but orange. And just like that, it absorbs all those colors, except orange. Orange, it says, I reject it. And that's the color you see. Strange to say, but true. All color is absorbed except the one we see. The subject says, ugh, don't like red. Well, that's ironic, because it's a red apple. Yes, I know, but I don't like red. It's a green apple. Well, because it doesn't like green. And likewise. So the orange you're actually eating is not an orange. It's anything but. Just playing with your head here, but that's the truth. Okay? So rejected colors is where colors come from. Here's an example. There's no sunlight. There's no, there's, this is a backlit scene, so everything is basically silhouetted. But as soon as the sun comes out, every single one of these, whoa, come back. Every single one of these rows of green is rejected color. And so is the yellow and the orange and the pink and the burgundy, the magenta. The tulip says, oh, I don't want to be anything but purple. Okay, you're purple. <laughs> it, it's like, what? No, it's true. Do your research. You'll find out. All the colors have absorbed except one. It says, I don't want it that color, and therefore it doesn't absorb by the tulip. And the light wave that is only left is the magenta. Otherwise, it would be Here comes the sun. Watch this. As soon as the light comes, and it reveals the colors that were rejected once again. Okay. All right, enough of that. Let's just go have some fun and shoot some color. I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, a, a really cool trick on how to shoot wide-angle lenses at f22 and you don't even have to focus your lens and every time you're going to get 15 inches to infinity and in focus every single time without focusing your lens how are we going to do that before we move on though white balance I want to talk to you about white balance a little bit people say to me what do you shoot with white balance you shoot auto right and I say never do I shoot auto why because it's always blue always blue this is direct sunlight, and there's auto. I use daylight, sunlight, direct sunlight, sunny, whatever it's called. 5200 Kelvin. Okay? Never auto. It's too blue. This is direct sunlight. Now I'm going to switch to tungsten and do this. I want to point out, the reason I'm doing that because I want to satisfy my own curiosity. I want to know, well, maybe this is a chance to you know, think about maybe tungsten. Tungsten, what are you, crazy? It's noon. Yeah, that's why I want to do it. Well, why don't you do it later in post? Because I'm here now. I just want to satisfy my curiosity. So I do. And I find out, yeah, it's interesting. But here's where it comes into play. This white balance. Any idea what it looks like, what it is? I want to say this one more time. That's daylight sunny. 
Here's auto. It's blue. Sunny. Blue. That's auto. I don't know why it is. Nikon is guilty of this. Canon's guilty of it. Fuji's guilty of it. Any auto white balance, for whatever reason, favors blue. A bluish cast. Huh? Oh, did you, did you, you want to say something? That's fine. Okay, never mind. Um, so let's move on and talk about where you want to do some more changes. Okay, this is sunny. Now, at this point, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to wait here until sunset. So let's pretend it's sunset and do a 10,000 Kelvin. That means shade white balance plus. Shades are on 7,200. But let's run it all the way to 10,000. And look what happens. Looks like sunny. Okay. Likewise, sunny. 10,000 Kelvin. Ooh, pretty cool. And once again, 10,000 Kelvin. Green is recessive. Red is advancing. Orange is advancing. Blue is recessive. Yellow is advancing. Purple is recessive. Which is why it's, it's arguable. Maybe your mind is working, or you're able to see the difference. But clearly, this red looks further out front than this green, and vice versa. Okay? And that's because of the advancing nature, visually, of colors. So let's begin with red. How many of you here like to shoot red? You may not realize it. Do you have a lot of red in your portfolio? The reason I'm asking, because years ago, Kodak used to say, if you want to liven up your pictures, put a little red in it. And it worked. Here's an example. Okay, just red. Line, texture, and the color red. Red. These are all just red. Coca-Cola's red. It's a white logo, but predominantly it's a red label. In terms of the packaging. Here's red again. Red. A little bit of red. I want to point something out to you about this here. There's a gesture, there's an expression coming from this guy. How'd that happen? The light streaming on the wall. This is in San Francisco in Chinatown. He's, he's actually got his head down like this. And I'm seeing him coming up the road. The students were amazed and shocked. But I had to do it, because I, I didn't want him to look down. And as he gets about here, I have to do this carefully. I just went, hey! <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> click, click. There you go. You got to do what you got to do, you know? So, I mean, he looks frightened, doesn't he? Yeah. All right. Uh, here, you don't have to yell. You don't, you're just you're so serene. <laughs> you just take the picture, sure. And uh, look at this, red and blue, okay? Subtle difference. He looks, even though, this is a funny part, okay, look. She looks really close, doesn't she? But yet the composition of the next one, I've actually got in closer, but he doesn't look as close as she does. Maybe, maybe in, uh, if you don't see that, that's fine. But I think she looks closer than he does. All right, orange. Orange is what? If red... I'm sorry? It's not orange. Yeah, right. Orange is not orange. Red's not red either. In any event, red and yellow got married and had a baby called orange. Okay? Which is why orange, believe it or not, is a color. If it's your favorite color, I got news for you. You're not going to like this. You may want to volunteer that it's your favorite color before I tell you why that's not good. It's okay, but so it is the number one color choice of narcissist worldwide <laughs> it's true okay why is that because orange never grows up it can never get married it can never be an adult it's forever the child of red and yellow and for that reason I don't know if you're aware of this but Pantone is a color company they make colored inks they just recently announced, which they do every single December, the color choice for the fashion industry every year. For the interior designers, for anybody relative who needs to know what the color choice is, Pantone makes those choices. They've been doing it for years. 
They just came out and said, we can't decide this year on a single color. So we've chosen yellow and gray. Just announced four weeks ago. Well, about seven or eight years ago it was, they decided to do orange. So Paris does what Paris does every year. The fashion designers went to work. Hermes, Chanel, Louis Vuitton, they all came out with orange. Worst sales year in the history of fashion. Great news for the narcissist, but beyond them, nobody else bought an orange. So, for what it's worth, if any of you may have got a great deal on that orange Chanel bag, half price. They couldn't get rid of them fast enough. So, it's not a sh you don't be ashamed if you own one, it's fine. But wear it on a special occasion. <laughs> anyway, orange. Color of flowers, orange poppies. Orange is the color of the country of Holland. The soccer team, football team, they're orange. The flag is orange. Orange Boom is a very famous beer with an orange label. And that's in Holland. Orange is the color of the Coast Guard in America. People that save lives when you get caught out in the oceans. The color of goldfish, which by the way, these are dead goldfish. They both died in, under my watch. I had goldfish, they died. You know how goldfish are. So what did I do? I saved them for later, put them in the freezer. And brought them out when I put them on this white plexiglass and did a, just a silly picture. I, mean, I don't know why I did it, but I did. In any event, it came in handy for this section on orange. And here we have orange sunsets and another orange sunset and an orange plane taken off into the sun. These kinds of pictures, you know, they draw you in and make you want to go on vacation, but you can't because of COVID, but next year, hopefully you can. And orange is the color of autumn. And again, all rejected. Here's my another point. Remember me, I'm the guy who likes to say, a closer look, what will that reveal? Well, look at this right there, that little bit of winky wink, as I call it. That looks to me like an eye. Okay? A young eye. An orange eye. That completely changes when it's red. Completely changes when it's cyan. That's Photoshop, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> okay. Yellow. How many have the, What's your favorite color, by the way? I should have asked you that. How many, favorite color of yellow, anybody? Yeah? Okay. You want to hear the news? <laughs> There's no news. Yellow, okay? Yellow and orange. Look at her right there. 45th floor of the Swiss Hotel in Singapore, shooting straight down with my 200 to 500 Nikkor from the balcony, of course. Yellow sunflowers, absolutely. Blue sky. We are again, you saw that before with the flash. Uh, yellow corn. This is all staged. Okay, you go to the store, you buy corn, you get a student, or in this case, my assistant, you get them all dirty, make sure his dirt's all, shirt's all dirty, and put some topsoil from the garden in there, and then he holds the corn, and you shoot it with a flash. That's it. Uh-oh. What happened? We went off again. Sorry about that. Let me know when it comes back. It's back. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yellow. Oh. Okay, good. Uh, yellow. By the way, number one color of flowers worldwide. Yellow. Number one. Just so you know. Okay. By the way, I hate to tell you this especially for those of you who look forward to getting your red roses. You realize you've been rejected, okay? <laughs> if, if your husband or your wife, whatever, if you get white roses, that's, fin they, that's real love because the red's inside. Now, you understand what I mean? The white is rejected color. Red's rejected color. So a red rose is really rejection. Think about it. So from now on, you should be saying, get me white, yellow, pink, anything but red. And that's true love. <laughs> what is going on over there? I don't know. In any event, once again, yellow and more yellow with blue eyes. Homeless guy having coffee. And I said, can I take your picture? I don't normally approach homeless people. But uh, he was really good looking. So I decided to approach him. And he said, fine. And then I come to find out he was an unemployed actor who'd been homeless for a couple of years, lost his family, his wife, you know, to drugs, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I said, well, good luck and said goodbye. 
Blue, color number one choice. 72% of the world, favorite color, blue. 72%, that's a lot, three out of four. Why blue, any ideas? Anybody here like blue? Yeah, why do you like blue so much? Yeah, I know you're wearing it, but why do you like it? Huh? Dramatic. Soothing. Yeah. You know how many words, of all the colors, for what it's worth, the color blue is used in songs and lyrics more than any other color. Especially country western, in case you know that song, you know. My dog left me and my wife did too, and that's why I got the blues, you know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, here's a blue dusk, what we call the blue hour, which is non-existent, by the way. There's no such thing. There's what we call a blue 20, meaning that 20 minutes after sunset and about 30 minutes before sunrise, you have dusk, blue. And it lasts for about eight minutes, just for what it's worth. More blue, just the ocean water with blue sky, big wave breaking. Here we got blue of night in Mexico. This was a stunning. I was shocked. Look at this purse. And look at this wall. And that's just, it just, that's just weird. That we're duplicating colors. Two complete strangers passing through the night. I mean, she doesn't know these people, I'm sure. Anyway, Amsterdam, dusky blue 20. This is Photoshop. Oh, come back. This is Photoshop. This is the original photo, just right here. Then I flipped it and just added this later. But uh, this was put there on purpose. Uh, I mean, this, this is, okay, that's a woman, obviously. And I, I told her to kind of lay down there, and so she did. And, uh, but, but this is all Photoshop. If you're going to do Photoshop, I have a number one rule. Tell people. Don't say, oh, no, this is natural. It's not. Okay, this is natural. And it's just a textured wall with blue and some green grass up against it. She approached me in Muscat, and she said, uh, are you a photographer? And I said, I guess so. She said, will you take my picture? Well, how often does that happen? I said, yeah, okay, but not here, which was two blocks away. I said, I do know if we go up the street a little bit, there's a blue wall that I'd like to photograph you against. And she said, okay. So we did, and the wind picked up and blew a little bit. And you'll see the shot here in a moment. But uh, right there, just a subtle little bit of wind picked up, and that's a slow exposure. I'm on tripod, 20th of a second, but again, the blue background, very, so very so soothing and calm. Color green. I hate green. Hate it. When I did my book, I realized I don't have any green pictures. <laughs> that I had to illustrate green, so I had to go out and reluctantly shoot green. And then I said, well, that's not bad. I, maybe I like green after all. So I'm underneath the ground or I'm underneath the fern, uh, shooting up. And the only reason I'm there is because I actually saw, down below, scurrying through the moss of the rainforest, a little mouse. And I thought, what does the world look like to him? So I became a mouse and looked up. That's what the mouse probably saw. Same idea here, wide angle lens, green. See, that's what I mean. It's just it's boring. It's just leaves. And Grass and foliage, dewdrops. I don't mind doing this. This is fun. Green backgrounds. By the way, green, let me tell you about green. Green is the symbol of hope, new beginnings, as well as fertility. There was a time in the Elizabethan era when brides' dresses were green to demonstrate their fertility hoped for fertility, if nothing else. And um, the idea of green being hopeful has a lot to do with spring. That's why we look forward to spring for people living in four seasons. Long winter, and we see green buds on the trees. Oh, spring is coming. Yes, because green buds on the trees. Symbol of hope. Shinier days ahead, warmer days ahead. Yep, purple. Symbol of royalty. There was a time until 1876 that only the rich could afford purple clothing, which is why we think of purple robes being worn by kings and queens. Why is that? Because purple, up until that year, was only available 
from a particular type of uh, oyster clam from the area around Egypt where the guts would be taken out of this clam and set on stone and dried and then they would be ground into a powder and that powder became purple dye. Very expensive. And then a guy in America, 1876, came up with a synthetic dye and the commodities market on purple just <laughs> went down. And everybody could afford purple. So, purple, again, is often associated with royalty. It's also the color of sunrise in some parts of the world. And purple tulips, again, keep in mind, these are all rejected colors you're looking at for what it's worth. Big storm coming in in Holland against all that purple. And uh, purple flowers, tulips, okay. Dubai, I forget which tower I'm in. I'm in one of the buildings nearby here. Any ideas where I'm at? Not, no, not index, no. No, index is uh, over here somewhere. But I, I'm, I'm actually somewhere, I don't know, this is a couple years ago. Yeah, so. Anyway, see the purple background? Bags of onions. So let's, let's move a little bit this way. Can, can you go over, yeah, right there, good. Okay, good, don't move. Good, okay, got you, got you covered. Well, there you go, there's your purple, okay? Yeah, green eyes with the purple, that's nice. Purple, we see this a lot with stars, Milky Way and whatnot. Here's the rain, when in fact it's not rain, it's a sprinkler. If you wanna shoot rain and get this effect, you gotta be at a 60th of a second. No faster, no slower, a 60th. Only a 60th makes what looks like rain streaks. 125th or too short, 30th or too long. I've tested this out. If people go, anything but this, they go, what is that, a sprinkler? But if I do a 60, they go, whoa, rain. <laughs> Something, how we perceive motion. Purple again, and more purple. Moon's coming up, hit him with a flash. Without the flash, we wouldn't see them, it'd be silhouettes. Triad color, what does that mean? You know the word tri, it means three. So triad color is simply three colors that form a triangle. In this case, yellow, blue, red. Could be orange, green, and purple. But triadic color is a combination of all three colors that make a triangle on the color wheel. So there's triadic color, triadic, triadic, triadic. Is it important that you know what it is, triadic? I mean, it doesn't matter. Okay, if it matters, then I'm happy to tell you. To me, it's not a reason to go out and shoot. Well, now I know a triad of color, so I'm going to go out and shoot. I don't understand the logic, but if that helps you, then I'm happy. This is not triadic, obviously. It's only red and yellow, as is the case here. No triadic at all. This is red and yellow. This is a reflection shooting up at a bus station in Singapore. They have this long walkway with mirrors up above, and of course the street is here, and so that's reflecting what's happening in the street. Again, nice clouds, um, but red and green, which are actually opposites. for church triadic, red, yellow, green. I mean, red, yellow, blue, and a little bit of green. Any guesses on where this background came from? I've told students this, and, and believe me, it's, 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 I've, it's, it's a proven fact. When you come out of your house looking like this and walk the streets, you are hoping a photographer will stop you and say, can I take your picture? You're hoping. And if you don't want that kind of attention, then you should never leave your house looking like that. So sure enough, here she comes. And I said to my students, oh, oh, get ready. Here comes a young girl, y'all, get ready. She wants you to take her picture. And how do you know that? Look at her. She wants attention. And you're going to say, I'm going to take a picture and send you a copy for your Facebook, and she's going to light up like a Christmas tree. So, we stopped her. Her name's Ella. Ella, what brings you out this morning on a Sunday? And she says, well, I'm just going down there to get some Starbucks. And I go, well, you look fabulous. Can we take your picture? <gasps> My picture? Really? Oh, I'd love that. What do you want me to do? I said, take off your jacket. It's cold. I said, I know, but I need a background. So, I had a student hold a background of her jacket. <laughs> There you have it. So now you know the background story. So she got eight photographs taken of her. She got all eight sent to her Facebook. She went and got her coffee. She had a fantastic morning. And sure enough, 
she did not say no to having her picture taken. Isn't that funny how the tree kind of mimics her hair? Yeah. Anyway, uh, more of that uh, analogous colors, which is what? Well, what does analogous mean? Similar, close, okay? So analogous simply means three colors. Yellow, orange, orange, and red, orange, as is the case here, okay? This is in Cancun, Mexico, just somewhere. That is a purple martin. Anybody correct me if I'm wrong? Is that a purple martin? I don't know my birds. It's a swallow, that much I do know, but I'm not sure which one. We got a yellow sign up here. I apologize, I don't have it in the shot, but it says the Lion King in Times Square, which is reflecting. You can kind of see it here. So I'm going to come over here a little bit, which will bring that sign in like so, and we end up with this. So again, there's a lot of analogous colors here between the wall and her clothing. Absolutely. And of course, the mountain range, analogous colors there. Again, leaving food on the table. You want to do that. Keep working it, working it, working it. Look at that right there. There's a great shot right there. Right there. And there it is. No problem. No matter what, this guy kept moving his cotton candy. He wouldn't let me take his face. <laughs> and I thought, that's a good thing. Why not? So there you go. Color complements. Opposites. You could spend all day doing this, purple and yellow. This is not what you want to do, though. And yet I had a student, this is a true story. I said, Betty, why are you including the barn in the pole? And she said, oh, I don't, I don't know why I did the pole. But the barn, I, of course I had the barn because I want people to know it's a farm. <laughs> I said, OK. It doesn't really do much uh, to add to the photo, but let's get rid of the pole. And do you still like it? And she goes, well, yeah, I think they, they need to know that there's a noun in the photo. <laughs> it's like, I think if all you did was photograph this, they would probably assume there's a farm nearby. That's my argument. And again, I said, get in tighter and do a crop like this. And she said, well, I'll just do it when I get home. <laughs> it's like we're here once again. I, I say that repeatedly in workshops. But we're here right now. Yeah, I know. but. I go, what, you got a dental appointment? <laughs> <laughs> so, for what it's worth, red and green. <clears throat> I put her in that window, just so you know. She lived there. But I, we were outside talking, and I said, go in your house and pose in the window. Just got lucky. This is at the Jardin de Tuileries in Paris. Early morning, this guy was asleep. I don't know who he is. No idea. Red and green. This is a plexiglass on a softbox. Softbox is there, shooting up. Big two foot by three foot plexiglass. Another light right here. And white frosted glass. So everything's transparent as I'm shooting through it. I gave her red fingernail polish. She was thrilled. She put it on. I said, when you get done, pose in the window. So she this is all about color, you guys. You could spend your whole life doing nothing but color. Just specifically shooting color. Color, 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 color. Now, that's in Burano, Italy, once again. Back in Greece. Mexico. Washington, D.C. I carry with me sometimes those little protein bars they come in handy when you want to get the ducks to come closer so i want a duck here with this reflection here he comes oh, here he comes get ready there he is oh good all right <laughs> yep well that's not natural Yellow, green. Your light meter is a dog. What do I mean by that? Dogs see black and white. Your meter doesn't see color. Maybe you didn't know that. It doesn't see color. It sees black and white. 
What I mean by that is, is that when it left the factory, even to this day, despite all the technology, technological advances, your meter is still looking at the world as if it's black and white. Okay? And here's what that means. The meter says, I've been told that the world is gray. And I've been told that when light hits the world, 18% of that light is reflected. And all my algorithms are based on an 18% reflectance. Well, that's fine and dandy for most colors, except for especially black and white. Meaning that when you come across shots like this, the meter says, got it. I see it like this. No problem. I get correct exposure. Likewise, oh, I see this. It's 18% gray. No problem. And it gives you a correct exposure. Uh oh, I don't know what that is, but it's so bright. Now, they didn't tell me about this, but don't you worry. I'll make it gray. And it underexposes the dog, which is white. Why? Because the meter says white does not exist in my vocabulary, only gray. So when I see something excessively bright, I'll make it gray for you. And when I see something excessively dark, I'll make it gray for you. So you end up getting underexposed white and overexposed black. How do you overcome that? You meter white at plus one every time. And you get a white dog. Here you got a monkey who's really thrilled, but he's black. The meter says, oh, that's dark, but don't you worry. I'll get you a gray monkey. It's like, no, I want a black monkey. So you go, minus one, whenever meeting, and he's much happier again. So, <laughs> okay. So let's talk about white. Plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. Okay, that's a plus one. That's a plus one. Plus one, why? Because the medium, excuse me, the middle of this is going to be influenced by the meter reading seeing the white dress. If all that white, oh man, the meter would love to make that gray, but don't you let it. You go plus one. Yes? Plus one on the meter in manual or aperture priority plus one. Okay? Okay. Black? Minus one. Got to be minus one. The meter looks at that and it says, whoa, that is really dark. Don't you worry, Brian. I'll make it gray. In other words, I'm going to overexpose it. But you say, no, you don't. We're going to take this at least minus one. Minus one. Now, here's a minus one, sort of. Not really. I'm just trying to make a point about black. We lose the white swan because of the white here. Let's wait. Wait, 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 <coughs> right there. I want to get a little contrast. Just a little, little tip for you, OK? Side lit, open shade behind. This is a tough exposure, normally. White and black, oh my goodness, what does the meter do here? It doesn't do anything, because you're doing what? Sunny 16, come on. Huh? Well, I don't know if it's 100. It could be 400 ISO. It's up to you. But my point is, this is a sunny 16, OK? Side lit, shadow behind it. Just the, Otherwise, the meter's going to go, I, so, <laughs> I'm not sure what to do with that. Black and white, OK? Which of those feels heavier, by the way? Obviously black. There's a great psychological test that no one has failed yet. You got a black cube on a table and a white cube on a table. And you tell a six-year-old the same thing. Pick up the heaviest cube. They always go with black. No one yet has gone for the white. I'm not sure what's going to happen when that happens, but nonetheless. Black and white with a red jogger. That's my daughter, who at the time was 12, in Chicago, about minus 20 degrees, on a Saturday morning, and Dad's going, go on, get up, go on jogging. What? No. Yeah, you're going to college, I think, right? What does that got to do with anything? Get out of bed. <laughs> And you're, you're going to college eight, year, eight years from now, okay? Or six, whatever. Anyway, uh, with, without her, I don't, I mean, it's, it's an okay photo, but I think the, the jogger, to me, made all the difference. I have her without her in the photo as well. But nonetheless, red is an advancing color in an overall black and white picture, very monochromatic. There's the cover of the book I was talking about. It's been flipped, but nonetheless, that's how the cover was done. Now, I got a bonus tip for you before we get to Photoshop. This won't take long. How are we doing on time? 
15, I'll be quick, okay. Your right angle lens is a great close-up lens. Let me show you how I mean by that. There's the close-up opportunity, you missed it. Move over and fill the whole frame with those white flowers, okay? Like so. Likewise, what do you got all this here? You got this over here as well. Look at that right there. Get down into this stuff, okay? And fill the frame with that foreground. Here we're laying down on the dandelions, okay? Everybody's got dandelions in the picture. You come to my workshop with red hair, you're going to model. Okay? So Olga is jumping on the street, and we're shooting through yellow dandelions, wide angle lens, massive depth of field. Everybody's shooting at F22. And here's what I'm going to give you the tip about. F22, manual focus from 24 or wider with a full frame. So 14 to 24, F22, focus at one meter. Manually focus, one meter. And stop. Don't do anything else. Now shoot. And you'll get everything in focus from 15 inches to infinity. That's the hyperfocal setting. What it's called, in case you didn't know that. Okay? If you have a DX, everything from 10 to 16. Focus at a meter. Look at this right here. Little opening. Oh, that's so nice. Let's put a lens right up against that and frame the distant windmill. Okay? Framing with a frame. Photoshop time, you ready? Then we're done. That's a photograph, obviously, of one of those people smoking electronic vapor cigarettes. Imagine for a moment taking that. I could never do this in camera, ever. A year later, I see this. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. It's just a texture. And then one day, I'm bored sitting at the computer, and I'm just going through stuff. And all of a sudden, I went, wait a minute. Hey. That and, oh, this could be fun. And sure enough, there you go. Photoshop. I could never do that in camera. Not in a million years. Look at this one. Makeup artist. A light from below. You can see it's one of those ring lights, those donut lights. Okay? I got a whole bunch of textures. You've seen them. Imagine if I put a texture over this and cover her skin. Not the eyes, not the lips, just the skin with texture. So you put a layer mask between the two, make a mask, and then you take the brush and you paint through to the textures. And boy, do I got a bunch to show you. There's one. There's another. 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 And another. I mean, you could do this all day long. Check out this one. This is a model covered in smoke, ashes from a forest fire. Okay? This is nothing more than screen against the backdrop of a tail light of a car that's about 10 feet away. And I sprayed water on the screen just to create a texture. And then Photoshop the two together. Wow. Pretty cool, huh? Sunlight coming through, lighting up the face like so. This takes some time, but how about doing a constant layer, like five or six layers of colors from the color balance menu, and you end up with this. Takes a little more time, but it's well worth it. My fun one here. I'll be here next week going to Kenya, Masai Mara. A couple of brothers here hanging out. What if I take that picture and make it super dark and then throw a tungsten white balance on it? Boom. That's what happens. Now, what if I go back with a mask and cover this area here to bring the light back and drop in a full moon? Ooh, yeah. Those are headlights from my car at night on the safari. Not really, but that's the idea, right? OK. Check out that lucky cow. The world map. <laughs> And he is so happy. Look at those choppers. <laughs> That's the entire world. This is a famous cow, world famous cow. He was born with the map. Look at it. US, South America, Africa, Europe, even Australia, New Zealand. Of course, it's Photoshop. But that's my point. That's what you cannot do in camera. So that's why you need Photoshop. Okay, I want everybody to say Photoshop is here to expand my vision not replace it, okay? Oh, remember my dead fish? 
put him in Iceland in an iceberg. I actually put this on Facebook, both of these, and I explained that when goldfish die in Iceland, they flush them down the toilet and they go out to the ocean, they come back frozen in icebergs. <laughs> and I had people respond saying, that's horrible. Oh my god, that's terrible. <laughs> they had no idea. I said, they really believed it. So I had to retract what I said. I got a letter from the mayor of this town, Vic. <laughs> he knew it was a joke, but he said, yeah, people are actually calling us up. So I said, oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, questions and answers. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, you bet. So, yeah. Any questions? Oh, it'll be animals, wildlife. Well, because it's it's not a wildlife presentation. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm, I don't shoot wildlife generally speaking. I mean, I only go there once a year. And um, to me, a wildlife shot, uh, I, I I don't really honestly say I don't really feel I have any wildlife shot that's going to set the world on fire. So you know, I don't have a kill. I don't have a chase. I don't have not, not a whole lot. So it isn't that I haven't shot wildlife, I just haven't been lucky. I tell you who to follow, uh, if you, if you, if you go, know Gucher and Rupa, uh, you, you guys know Gooch? Yeah? What, what's his handle on Instagram? I forgot. Is it just Gooch? Go Goocheran. Yeah, Goocheran. G-U-C-H-A-R-N. A-R-A-N. He's, he's a friend. He lives in Nairobi. He works for uh, Caterpillar, uh, but his side job is phenomenal photography. And um, he'll set up his tripod with a super wide in the elephant trails. 